There we go. Now it's now it's recording. Okay, does anybody want to do a prayer or you want me to do the prayer? Want you to do the so well. Um in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Um <clears throat> Holy Spirit, continue to fire up the faithful and let them get excited about Jesus in this church and let them get excited about the theme of today's class, which is overshadowing. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Amen. Um, by the way, I'm recording all these, and um, they're all going on YouTube. Um, and you can find them here in this little I'm going to find dreadful handwriting. Good grief. You know, I get up here and I, and I can tell from my hands. Summerpalooza 2015. That is the YouTube name of that is the YouTube name of this um, lecture series. So the other one, the first one was is already up, and each week I'll upload the, the next little round. And, but that's where they're all going. As long as you search on that, it's going to be a playlist. And so if you miss one and you're sorry that you missed it, you can make it up there. So each one is going to be. A, a a different number. Yeah, in other words, the, the, the first is like, the, the, the one that's up there now is like some of Palooza, class one, right. part okay. one, two, and three. And you know, if you just set it to play all, it'll just bump right to the next one. The, 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 the camera breaks it up. Yeah. That's a great idea because it's summertime, so many people, you know, miss a lot. Yeah, yeah. So, anyway, kind of interesting. Um, kind of fun. All right, let's see what we're starting off tonight. Um, oh, I want to say something about last week. Remember we were talking about love, this idea that love powers the universe and everything. And I don't want anybody to think that that's some newfangled idea that just jumped out of my mind like, like Zeus's children or something. Um, <laughs> at least as far back as Dante, which is, oh dear, 15th century maybe? Um, at the end of his, his third, he wrote, he did, wrote that trilogy, uh, whatever it was, The Inferno, Purgatory, and Paradise. I think it's in the end of Paradise that he, he confronts or he, he has this vision of, of, he doesn't say God, he says he has a vision of l'amor qui move il sole e le altre stelle, which means he, he sees the love that moves the sun and the other stars. Remember, I, I don't remember when I first read that, but I thought, wow, what a concept that, that love moves all this stuff. So I, mean, I got very excited about that. But it's a great comfort to think, well, it's not big news Dante thought of it 500 years ago or something. Well, he was with Beatrice at that time. Yeah. She, 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 she brought him through paradise. Ooh. See, I'm, I'm one of these people that, you know, I know five lines out of the whole schmear. I don't really know anything about it. But even I learned something that was, you know, kind of a life changer, a game changer for me. Um, and here's something else before we get any further. You know, every week, every week we'll be having a different theme and the, the, the best ones we'll take is from the earliest mention of the theme in the Bible all the way to the last mention in the theme, and, and it'll say something about how the Catholic Church thinks and how the Catholic Church works. Um, and let's see if anybody can see if y'all know what this thing is. It's a very simple drawing. You might know what this is? A mushroom. A mushroom. Oh, genius. Okay, now does anybody know, anybody know what this is? If, 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 this is a, if that's a mushroom, if these are mushrooms. Never seen one of those. You know what that is? Don't know what that is. Never seen a ring of mushrooms. Yeah. <laughs> okay. A ring of mushrooms. No, no, no. Ah, but this has a special name. It's a fairy circle. Oh. Um, yeah, a fairy circle. And we have one in my backyard. And every year, it doesn't come up every year, but, but every year the fairy circle incrementally grows. And there are some fairy circles that, that, that are, I'm, I'm thinking like a, a half a mile in diameter. They've been growing for thousands of years. There's some thing about fairy circles. Usually when people think about faith at Catholicism, you think, oh, this is, this is kind of like a tree. And the tree goes up, and here's a branch, and there's a branch, and there's a branch, and there's a branch, and there's a branch. All goes up, and then out here you've got all the foliage, you've got some little bitty flowers, and you might envision, say, baptism might be here, and the Eucharist might be here, and pick something. What else? Mass. The mass might be over here, and the Bible might be over here, and it's, you can trace all these little branches down. No. I don't want you to think about the Catholic Church like a tree. I want you to think about it as a fairy circle because here's the cool thing about a fairy circle is you look at the fairy circle and you think, ooh, these are all, look at all the different mushrooms in the fairy circle, but that's not right. What, the, the fairy circle manifests itself as all these individual mushrooms, but the fact is that it is a single organism 
And if you if you kick the dirt inside a fairy circle, there's it's like this ashy, white, tiny little filaments, like thinner than your hair. And those things are called mycelia. And the mycelia are just this humongous web that the whole thing is all interconnected. There's no real part of it that's that's not equally connected to every other part because of the mycelia. And the whole thing is like a singularity that that grows. Each, each year, and that's the way I love to think about the Catholic Church, because really everything about the Catholic Church is one gigantic whole, even though all the connections are not necessarily apparent. And um, it's, yeah. this has been a great model for, for my life once I began to, it's once I got this idea connected to Catholicism, I began to think of it as just this gigantic interrelated blob, which forced me to think about it as a big picture instead of the individual leaves of the individual branches. So that worked out I pretty well. My Ooh, let's see. Well, by the way, let's digress, shall we? Um, here's mycelia. Um, anytime you see a, a word in English, and the first letter is a consonant, and the second letter is a Y, but 95% of the time, that's going to be a Greek word. Um, good for absolutely nothing. <laughs> but it's nice to know, I suppose. Anyway, believe it or not, can't have some uh, analyze my windex. Material we're supposed to cover tonight. Um, let me see what I let me see what I had written down. Okay, I remember last week we everything was swell and even I got to kind of cut to the chase to get to, to, to tonight's theme before I run out of time because I digress. Um, remember at the end of at the end of chapter two in in Genesis last week is everything was so doggone wonderful and the men and women were naked and they were not ashamed and that was the last line of the best part of, of, of human existence. And then chapter 3 starts off right away with the snake and, and Eve and all that bad stuff. And then we're thrown out of Eden and all that kind of dreadful thing. Now, does anybody remember when Adam and Eve, when Adam and Eve sinned, did God get rid of Eden? No. 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 <laughs> what did God do? He didn't get rid of Eden. What did he get rid of? Yeah. Got rid of Adam and Eve and says, yeah, boot out. Yeah. Eve is fine. Adam, Eden is fine. You're the problem. Out you go. And remember what kept them from getting back in. Yeah, what was the sword? Sword point. Yeah, what was it? What was the creature? Cherub. Oh, yes, a cherub. Good trick question. Hey, in, in Sunday school, we like to spell it this way. It's more the, the Hebrew way, cherub. And it comes from what's called a Semitic triliteral root. Like, who cares? But it matters. It will matter before the end of the summer. It comes from, from a uh, Semitic triliteral root from which a number of words can come from, and what it means is near one. And um, they're near ones, and they carry swords because they're understood to have been the body, God's bodyguards. That's why they're so near him. There's cherubim, which are the near ones, the ser seraphim are the flaming ones, and the cherub being the near one, God's bodyguard, who kind of protects his dignity. Um, that's why he's got the sword. Because remember, if you think of this word, you always have to get the kids over this. You know the way we spell it this way. What that brings to mind is fat little silly baby shooting a little toy arrow into people's butt. You know that kind of thing? Okay. No. But that's not, no, 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 no. This is carobs. Carobs are serious as cancer. They have big sword, swords. They will cut you. Okay? Now, just to remind you about that is remember, remember when the ark was coming back to Jerusalem, it was on the wagon. And the wagon began to tip over and look, it was going to fall over, fall over in some rut and dump the ark onto the ground, and this poor fellow named Uzziah, in trying to help, put his hand up and touched the ark to stop it from coming down, and he was struck dead. I think he was struck dead by a carob, which of course we don't see. And, and the thing is, is the carob had to protect God's dignity. Now, one of the things I like about carobs, which matters a lot tonight, is that carobs have wings, as we will find out. Actually, I don't think there's any account of, of an angel in the Bible having wings, but we give them wings to remind us that, yeah, okay, that's the angel and messenger comes from heaven. Look, see the wings? The creatures that get the credit for actually having the wings are the, are the carobs. Now, let's see. Ah, uh, so after having been thrown out, and it's all been miserable since then, you know, people got so ratty and mean and everything that God flooded everything, and Noah survived in his family, and it was okay to eat meat. Then we had Abraham, and then we had all these other people which we don't have time for right now, but we may have time later. Because all I want to get to is Egypt. And remember, who got the people out of Egypt? His name was? Oh. Moses. Oh. Yes, y'all know everything. Moses got them out of the promised land. Now, when they crossed out, in, when they crossed over the Red Sea, then where were they? Sinai. Yeah, they were in the Sinai, the Sinai Desert. Now, oh, I need this for a 
second. Uh, you said they were allowed to eat meat. Yes. At one time, were they vegetarian? Oh yes, oh yes, Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve, Genesis is very specific, it says, I give to you all of the green things that grow, all the flowering things, everything that bears fruit shall be meat to you. And it wasn't until Noah saved the animals and brought them back out as part of the second chance, at, at the second go around at creation, that then God told Noah, he says, you and your descendants can now the, the animals shall be meat for you. But the fear and dread, the fear and dread of you, they will have. And, and, and it's like this terrible payoff. It's like God was saying, um, okay, those animals owe you their lives because you saved them. In that sense, they owe you their lives and they owe your descendants their descendants' lives. So now you're free to eat them if you want to, but at the cost of them living in the fear and dread of you. And um, it's an interesting trade-off. And I think that's one reason why the Catholic Church every Lent says, don't eat meat for Lent. I mean, it's a way of recalling this more humane time when, when people didn't kill animals in order to have something to eat. Hey, Nestor Acosta's object. He, he told us that before. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah that's, oh, that's so I, fascinating. I thought he didn't know what he was talking about. Oh, no, no. Yeah. Anyway, um, I have to sing now. That's right, suddenly, I'm not half the man I used to be. It's a hard song to sing. There's a shadow hanging over me. Oh, yesterday came suddenly. All right, now tell me, why, what does it mean that there's a shadow hanging over me? Is that good or is it bad? Good. Is it good? There's, in that song, it's good to have a shadow? Why? Am I in a good mood when I sing that lyric about the shadow hanging over me? Well, then what does it mean if I have a if I say oh, there's a shadow hanging over me? What do I mean? Sin. Yeah, but but just in, a, in yeah, but but just in, in a generic sense of anybody saying that, it's just a shadow hanging over me. Yeah, it's like I'm depressed. It's 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 cold. It's wet. I'm in the shadow. It's not good. And it's kind of like oh, I I would love in the song I would I would love to come out of the shadow and be in the sunlight again. How much nicer that would be, right? But Let's think about this. I need a volunteer. I need, you're gonna be my volunteer. Come on, come on, don't be shy. No, 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 you need a woman, you need a woman. Are there any women in here? Thank you, come up here. All right, you're my volunteer. Come see, come back, come, 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 come back over here. That's good. Now, it's, forget about, forget about temperate, a temperate climate. You're out in the Sinai Desert. You are out there and you're like, Got nothing. <laughs> what, what, now, you want to live till sundown. What do you need? Water. You don't. You survive till you can go to sundown without some water. What else do you need? Shade. Yeah. Oh, yeah. look. I have some shade. Yeah, I'm quite comfortable under here. Now, <laughs> <laughs> the question is, the question is, would you like to be under the shade? I would. Okay. Well, here you go. Oh uh, no 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 no! You get to be under the shade. But it's my shade. <laughs> now, now I, in, in, a, in a desert culture, I'm not just overshadowing you. It's not just a sweet little thing. I am protecting you. I am helping keep you alive. Remember, if you have a tent in the desert, it's not to keep the rain off of you. It's to keep the sun off of you so it doesn't burn you to death. Now, now let's watch. Now let's watch our little relationship for a minute, shall we? Let's see how this works. Yeah. See. <laughs> now, now this illustrates this illustrates a mutual relationship which is generated by the fact that one overshadows the other. First of all, I agree to overshadow you. And what do you agree to? To follow you. Yeah, you agree to follow me and to remain overshadowed. So it's a mutual thing. It's not, I don't dictate, you don't dictate. We both, we both agree, and so we have a kind of a, a partnership, okay? All right, it's safe for you to sit down now, thank you. <laughs> now, what I wanna say, what I wanna cover during the rest of the night is that there's there is in the Bible a covenantal relationship between things that are overshadowed and things that are not overshadowed. Now, let's see. Uh, I use the word overshadow, but actually in the Old Testament Hebrew, Hebrew is a very, very, it's one of the most primitive languages. Not primitive in a bad way, but primitive is in, it's, it's, it has, did not change a lot. And, and written records of it go very, very far back. And they didn't have a lot of words like, like Greek does and a lot of words like English does. We were both very 
Langu our, our, our languages, our, our lectionaries, our dictionaries are very rich. In, in Hebrew, a lot of times, they talk about this, and, and you can forget about it, I just like to, I just like Hebrew. Um, ah, see, but I like it so much, I can't spell it though. Sakak, and um, I think it's this one, kasa, are two words that mean cover in Hebrew. And, and there was a lot of occasions in the Bible where, where, where Hebrew was saying something covered something. And it's not just in the sense of just, just covered it, but in the sense of protected it. Frequently it's protected it from the sun. Um, other times it's other kinds of protection, but that primary idea that the sun will kill you if you don't get some shade over you is, is just a very important operative theme in the Old Testament. And actually this carries through all the way to a Catholic church right down over there at St. Mary's. We'll see before class is over time, if I talk fast enough, why this theme, in fact, exists today. And why the Catholic Church continue, is, is like carries a link between the Old Testament and what happens in Revelations, where there's also some interesting overshadowing. Trust me. Now, um, where, where did I put? There it is. See, I've got one set of marks on the side, one set on the top. That's supposed to keep me from confusing myself. Now, remember, <laughs> Moses went out into the desert and... Moses had to, had, had to go schmooze with God. Does anybody remember where Moses went to schmooze with God? Bowling alley? No. Um, shopping mall? No. Uh, well, they were in the Sinai. Let me put it this way. If you want to get closer to God, how do you get closer to God? Go up. Yes, you go up. By the way, um, let's say you live in a real flat culture, and you don't live where there are a lot of mountains. Let's say you live in Mesopotamia. There's no mountains. What do you do if you want to get closer to God? You build an artificial mountain. Yeah, you build a ziggurat. If you're an Aztec, you build yourself an aztec -y pyramid. Yeah, so people will build themselves an artificial mountain if they need one in order to get closer to God. Fortunately, Sinai has mountains. So Moses was going to go up and schmooze with God on Sinai. And this is a little bit from Exodus. It says, Moses went up into the mountain. Let's see. Yeah, the Lord commanded him, come up to me on the mountain, and while you are there, I will give you the stone tablets. So he went to the mountain of God. And after Moses had gone up, a cloud <coughs> succocked the mountain. It covered the mountain. And it says this. Let's see. And the glory of the Lord settled upon Mount Sinai. The cloud covered it for six days. And on the seventh day, he called to Moses from the midst of the cloud. To the Israelites, the glory of the Lord was seen as a consuming fire on the mountaintop. But Moses passed into the midst of the cloud, and he stayed there for 40 days and 40 nights. And by the way, when you hear the number 40, it shows up all the time in the Bible. How long was Moses in the ark? How long did it rain? 40, 40, 40 days. days. See, these are easy questions. Um, and then, so Moses went up and hung out with God on the mountain for 40 days. How long did the Israelites wander in the desert? Yes, how long did Jesus fast in the desert? Yes, yeah, so and when you see a 40, you want to say, think something in particular. There are, there are probably three numbers we'll cover this year that matter. Three, seven, 40. 40, think of it as just a generic way. How many thieves did Alibaba have? 40. 40 thieves, yeah. So 40 is a Semitic way of saying a whole bunch. And you say, could, 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 could Jesus have fasted for 41 days? Yes, he could have. It's just a long time is what that means. The second implication of 40 in the Bible is it's a time of preparation. In the Bible, when something happens for 40 days, it's not like, oh, then you just went back to your normal life. No, 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 no. After 40 days, something particular happened. Um, oh, and by the way, I, it's okay if y'all take notes, but remember, you can always <laughs> see this on YouTube if you don't want to write. Um, but it's up to you. All right. So here's what's so, here's what's so nice. What happens is here's Sinai. And by the way, Mountains, by their very nature, are hierarchical, which we'll get to later. Anyway, so Moses goes up here, and here's Moses, and he is having a fabulous time up at the top of the mountain. And then God's glory cloud covers the mountain. And remember, what we want to think about is, is God's cloud overshadows the mountain so that Moses is in the shade. Oh, this is so nice to be where it's cool. And remember, after he's been out there for a while, he actually goes up into the mountain where it's cool and moist and every good thing you want in the desert. Now, I love the name for this cloud. First of all, it's referred to as the glory cloud. Believe me, that says glory. Mm. And this other word is just terrific, too. I think it said it in here, didn't it? Um, well, I'm looking and I'm not seeing it. 
Okay, it says, oh, the glory of the Lord settled.